Hello, and welcome to the next Art in the Contemporary World podcast. My name is Francis Horsell. I represent Art in the Contemporary World here, um, but we're talking to you today from Cranbrook um, Academy of Art and Design in Michigan. Um, I'm joined by two people here um, this afternoon, so perhaps we could all introduce ourselves. Um, my name is Anthony Warnick, and I'm a first-year um, student in sculpture. My name is Kelly O'Brien, and I'm a second-year uh, student in the design department. And um, as I said, I'm, I'm Francis uh, Holsell, representing Art in the Contemporary World, but for the last eight weeks I've been visiting um, Critical Studies Fellow here at Cranbrook, um, delivering lectures and seminars on um, elements concerning critical theory and so forth. Um, okay, well, where should we begin? We, perhaps you could give, and then I can respond to that, um, some kind of description or overview of your experiences of Cranbrook and let the um, listeners know what Cranbrook is. Um, well, I'm in the three-dimensional design program, and it's my second year, so I started last September. Basically, our program deals mainly with furniture design, product design, interface design, and then a lot of times interactive design. Um, however, our department has a huge emphasis on human interaction and relationships between space, objects, and people. So my work kind of falls into an alternative category of communication between people and space. And it would be fair to say that a lot of Cranbrook's reputation is built upon its design departments. Oh, absolutely. It was started by the Sarenins, who were huge furniture designers from Finland, and continued by Charles and Ray Eames up to this, like the current days with the McCoys. And um, we have a lot of very famous um, designers come out of Cranbrook, including ones who have worked for Microsoft. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So how does sculpture relate to that language? What are you studying? Um, so sculpture is one of sort of a group of the sort of fine art disciplines that are sort of also represented at Cranbrook and they're one of the first sort of artists that the Serenins brought over from Europe was um, Mills who was a bronze caster of you know some repute and sort of he started a sculpture department that was focused mainly on producing very sort of similar work to his own and a sort of that tradition of the specifically sort of public sculpture and very masculine public sculpture was sort of continued up even through the 80s. Um, and the current sort of artist in residence of sculpture has sort of transformed it quite a bit because of her interests being more related to sort of sculptures that are not <laughs> made out of metal and not outside. Um, but I guess that gets to part of what makes Cranbrook unique is the sort of educational model here is very different. So when I say artist in residence, I mean there is one faculty member for each department. Um, so in sculpture, the faculty member is uh, Heather McGill, and she is the sort of overseer of 15 students, mm -hmm. give or take, each year. Um, I think that that is worth emphasizing again, that this is a very, very different model to what I would be used to, and I work in a small institution of several thousand students, but we've got 150 students here, right? It's yeah. just a graduate school. There are 10 departments split between fine art and design, including architecture, with 150 students. Yeah. And 10 artists in residence. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we have no other faculty members, no other teachers, we invite guest critics such as yourself and um, guest artists who come from all over the world for short workshops or lectures um, and give us, I guess, an alternative voice in reviews. But for the most part, it's mainly student-driven and the artists in residence, or as we call them, the heirs, um, kind of play a, a backseat role and their job is to help you, I guess, when you start to veer off course, they reel you back in and um, <clears throat> facilitate me conversations. Mm -hmm. it, that's been exciting for me to come in because there isn't a, an arts and resident critical studies, for example, so it meant that there's been a, amongst a large proportion of the students, obviously not all of them, but a, an enthusiasm for critical studies. I mean, just because it's not there doesn't mean that the students are not engaged in that material, but um, I guess that's been my job over the last eight weeks to have critical discussions of 
about to work. Um, the only other model I know that's fam similar to this, and this is one that some of the people back home will be familiar with because of its relationship to a show in Emma recently, and a couple of us did a visit there, is the Stadel Schuller in Frankfurt, um, where you would have a similar model of, I guess it's an apprenticeship model, right? Yeah. It's quite old-fashioned yeah. that you would have a, a single artist in residence. In Frankfurt, it's people like Douglas Gordon and Simon Starling and McDonald and Krebber and so on. And you'd get 10 to 15 students operating under them. Yeah. The big difference, maybe we could talk about this, is that there, there it's free. Mm -hmm. Here it's not free, right? Right. Um, I mean, I think that this is... Uh, major portion of sort of higher education in the United States is that even if you're going to the institution that receives state funding, it's still never free for the students um, unless you get sort of very exemplary sort of scholarships based on sort of merit. So that's one sort of big feature that makes sort of the American model of higher education different than lots of other sort of countries is that no matter who you are, you're going to be spending money if you go to college or university. If you want a master's degree, you're going to be spending even more money. And so debt is sort of a very large, omnipresent sort of thing, especially in art schools and especially in sort of art programs. Um, and so this, the fact that Cranbrook is a private institution. It doesn't receive any state funding. All the funding either comes from donations, endowments, or the sort of tuition of the students um, sort of changes the model. Sort of. With that being said, I think we do have a large number of students who choose to come here from Europe and Asia yeah. um, because of the prestige of the school. I know particularly in my department, it's number three in the country and has a huge history of success and mm -hmm. famous artists. But um, in showing fibers, it would be number one according to a certain mm -hmm. ranking. Ceramics number two. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, and even the fine art departments are, are higher yeah. in the rankings. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's be clear about that. Almost every um, program in our school is at least in the top ten of the um, the country. If not, some of them are pretty internationally ranked as well. Um, so you definitely spend your money wisely coming here, and there's no other program like it in the United States, where if you go to a lot of schools that might give you funding for graduate school, you're required to teach and go to classes and learn things that are maybe not necessarily directly related to your individual practice. And here you get essentially a two-year professional studio practice, and so you have two years of your life to develop and really invest your time in an individual studio practice, unlike anywhere, any other school. Mm -hmm. So when you leave, you've been working as a professional artist for two years at that point. You've been showing your stuff in shows. You've been trying to get your name out there. You've been creating a large body of work to really, um, I guess, set yourself apart from most of the other graduates pro from programs. Mm -hmm. Already we've started to talk about kind of debt and money and private and so forth. I'm going to put those on hold for just a sec, because I think we're going to come back to those in a, in, in a little bit. But just before we do that, and we've started to talk about it a little bit, but it, it might be a way of unpacking some other elements of what it's like to study here. Maybe you could both say, in sort of more concrete terms, specifically why you wanted to come here, and or what has been the actual benefit in terms of your own particular practice of being here, rather than the more general points about um, it being a studio practice, which you put very nicely here. Um, for me, the thing that drew me here is the fact that it's one of the few institutions where they actually practice interdisciplinarity instead of simply talking about it. Um, and I think there is an important difference. There are a few programs that are dedicated either to interdisciplinary practice or transdisciplinary practice or any number of other sort of labels, but they're not based in a discipline in the way that it is here and here it is very much you're in a discipline and then you work across disciplines or with other disciplines or between disciplines um, in a, a way that is sort of 
open for new ways of working, but also sort of carries through lots of the conversations that sort of connect art history and collect, connect to the history of mediums and materials. Um, yeah, I, the, I mean, all of my conversations here have been very, very rich, but the ones I valued in particular, including the ones with you, obviously, is the ones where with studio disciplines that I would have less of an engagement with back home mm -hmm. um, in terms of crits, particularly things like fibres, ceramics, um, and metals, precisely for the reasons that you've said, that actually I see a real strength in that here. The students who are doing those traditional design disciplines are learning what it means to talk about their work in relation to kind of fine art discourses mm -hmm. and theories that are drawn from art history and, and, yeah. and so on. That, and that seems to be a real strength of, the, yeah. of it here. And how about 3D? I mean, we haven't talked about what you do, but that seems initially like a very odd place for you to be given that you are superficially anyway doing some kind of social practice and you seem to be in a department that makes furniture, Kelly. Yeah, I, I guess um, coming from an architecture undergraduate, um, there was a huge emphasis in my undergraduate training on, I guess, interactions between people and space and the idea is that you can diagram those things two-dimensionally and then create three-dimensional forms from understanding those relationships. And the three-dimensional design program essentially acts the same way. We talk a lot about human interaction and human intuition within design and objects and their relationship to the larger space of the room, the house, the land, the environment. Um, and so I, I think all of that ties into how you understand social practice and the psychology of human intuition and how people are going to react in certain environments. So I think the department definitely has the abilities to talk about those kinds of things in certain ways that other departments might gloss over for, I guess, other priorities. Um, so I think the emphasis there is really important for me that we deal with people as a, as a consumer, as an object, as a user of space. So that definitely really helps. But, and that was something that drew, drew me here, but also, as AJ was saying, the opportunities that I can work in a three-dimensional design program and then walk over the sculpture and have a different conversation about the same stuff that where they may be more familiar with social practices and art form versus installation art and interactive architecture that I've been dealing with um, prior to my studies here. And then there's a lot of opportunities to talk to people in every other department and go over there and become part of their discussions and part of their critiques and reviews and really hone in on the language. And I think it's important for to say that like having a design department that operates in an art school puts us in a very like a very unique place in which we can draw heavily from the art world and it really influences, as you can tell in all the students work in our department, how you think about products and how you think about furniture when you can also talk about it as an art form. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm really, I mean, I'm very jealous, actually, that um, the, the amount of visitors you get in, that seems like a, a real strength of this, that people want to come here and they want to talk to the students, and it means that every week there's a new visiting lecturer or critic or whatever bringing these new voices in, which um, means that the, this apprenticeship model that you have here doesn't become too rigid or fixed or stayed, quite obviously. Does. And I guess that's been my role and I'm here as one of two that come this year, this academic year so Anthony Burt was my predecessor, he came here before to talk about a very different thing I guess you weren't here um, AJ but could you explain maybe Kelly something of the role of the critical studies fellow if you feel comfortable doing that Sure, <laughs> um, I think they're to act mainly as a disturbance within the college because we get really set in our ways and you have one primary voice for every department which becomes the artist in residence whose job it is to pick out the students and curate the I guess environment in which we all find ourselves every year they choose certain students who they know are going to bring a certain value and conversation to the departments. And so then when you get somebody in who maybe challenges that authority and those kind of conversations, it really starts to, I guess, get the kids asking questions. Mm -hmm. um, I've had a lot of questions asked of me, which <laughs> it's been great. And I do like the idea, although it's kind of hard work of being a disturbance and an irritant rather than a, a kind of 
kind of a mammalian. But anyway, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, um, and so, yeah, I think it's really helpful that we have somebody coming in here who's maybe not dealing with physical objects or even art making, but all the thought processes and proposals of what making art in this day and age could mean and the different kinds of theories. And so I think, I feel like we've had a lot of variants over the past two years from Shannon Stratton of Chicago and Three Walls to Anthony Burke from New Zealand to you as well. Um, all looking at things in different ways and trying to create conversations that get us to answer our own questions and ask more questions of others and challenge our preconceptions of the art world. Um, I think so that we're getting an overview of Cranbrook and I think that's really, really kind of helpful because it is special. Um, it's going to be difficult to leave um, in some respects. Uh, it's this close-knit community of... Yeah, that's something we haven't mentioned is that half the students and all of the faculty members live on campus. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a very... And even the students who live off campus spend you know, 90% of their waking day here. So it really is a very sort of tight-knit community. It is. I mean, we're, I, the first week it was a culture shock for me because I didn't have a car, and it was very, very cold. It was minus 20, and I made the mistake of walking to the local shop, which is, was, was, was a mistake. I so you, there is a kind of sense of isolation, perhaps. A kind of, it's been mentioned several times, a sort of a monastic attitude mm -hmm. here, but that has both sort of positive and negative connotations, I guess. I see mostly the positive side of that. Um, I suppose the, the other thing that would be interesting for listeners to, to, to get a sense of is we're getting a sense of Cranbrook overall, but perhaps um, some sort of more specific things about its environment. Cranbrook is an environment, but also the very, very particular, and we, we must get to this, the environment that it's situated within both Oakland County, this place of extreme privilege and wealth, and then the larger area of including Detroit and, and Pontiac, which are, have enormous social problems. Um, but I, the reason that it was interesting talking to you two then was that both of your work talks about those particular environments, so maybe we could sort of discuss particular elements of the work you've been doing over the last while as a way of unpacking those environments. My work is definitely interested in irritating or... Um, sort of disrupting the flow and I think lots of it is the sort of cultural sort of headspace of the institution um, sort of from how it thinks about its history to how it thinks about what it is that um, gives the objects we make here value um, and I think that one very sort of important statement that we haven't really made about Cranbrook and something that sort of is makes me sort of I guess different is that most of the people in the fine arts are very interested in uh, making physical objects making formal and sort of craft decisions and are very good at it and some of the sort of best I've ever seen in those sort of ways or modes of working and the way I work is very um, I guess in opposition to that or I guess demarcated from that in that it is sort of intellectual conceptual um, and not as interested in objects sort of objects exist solely to maybe sort of give a focus to the conversation or sort of give a place for the conversation to take place cool. or the disruption. Why don't you give us an example that tells us about the, the the snow piece. Yeah. Um, so one of the pieces I made recently dealt with the... Inga oh, so Cranbrook is a larger educational community. We guys didn't say that. There are a few other schools on the same ground. So there's 300 acres. There's this sort of art academy. And there's a high school a middle school and an elementary school. So and a museum, and a museum, a library, and a science. Yeah, and an institute of science. So, so there's lots of other things on the grounds, and so the care for the grounds is sort of taken place by a separate department. So it's not the academy doesn't take care of the walkways. It it's only sort of employees are the people necessary for its functions, sort of the heirs, the dean, director, those sort of 
the librarian. Um, and so there's a very sort of famous set of pools here that have paths on either side um, that are sort of regularly walked by the students, but during the winter fall into almost complete disuse because they're not shoveled. So they get covered by a couple of feet of snow and then sort of disappear. And the architecture and sort of the way people move around the space changes quite dramatically. Um, so the piece that I sort of, or I guess the intervention that I made was to shovel half of sort of this walkway, which then, um, I guess, did a couple things, but the most sort of obvious of which is it made it clear that the pathway wasn't being cleared by the sort of groundskeepers. And they came in the next day sort of very immediately once they realized that it was sort of... So once it was obvious that something had been done at 9 a.m. the next morning, they sort of brought in a front loader and cleared the rest of the path. Um, so they were able to do it in about 10 minutes. Right. Me yeah, it had hours. taken me several hours to clear one side, and the rest of the sort of path was cleared in, yeah, 10 minutes and um, a very large machine. And then it resulted in you billing Cranbrook for the hours of labor in which you put in. <laughs> right. Um, so I sent Cranbrook a bill for my work, which, you know, was quite substantial compared to the labor that it took the sort of groundskeepers. Uh, but I, it pointed out sort of how a few things. One, that the only time it's noticed is when it's clear that something wasn't done correctly. Mm -hmm. So there's a, maybe obsession with um, appearance. And if people don't know there's a path there and don't see it, then it shouldn't be. It, people won't think about it or worry about it. And it sort of falls out of the mind. But once it becomes clear that sort of something hasn't been done and something doesn't look quite right, then sort of they step in and clear the path. And the... Like there's something interesting about the, the, the kind of the appearances of this and the way that you're kind of, and I think it's important for many students to do this to sort of reflect upon the, the kind of hidden conditions of this environment. Well, since I've been here, one of the things I've been absolutely fascinated by is that the walkway, the Knoll walkway, Knoll named after the furniture designers, right? Florence Knoll. She's yeah. a graduate of both the yeah. high school and the graduate uh, art academy. Yeah. So she has a, a, a walkway named after her, as I'm sure we all aspire to. And uh, in front of the museum, and it's heated. This mm -hmm. has been um, a sort of ongoing fascination of mine. So, so, yeah, it's always clear of snow. When it rains, it sort of steams in this really eerie, bizarre way. You can lay on it and feel the warmth of the of enormous amounts of electricity being radiated into the environment. The, the warmth of the Cranbrook love. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and the path that I cleared sort of meets the Knoll walkway at sort of 90 degrees. Mm -hmm. um, and I... I think that it is really sort of strange to me how we, well, a few different things. I mean, the students almost never think about the sort of large apparatus that has to exist outside of the academy to sort of make the academy possible. Mm -hmm. um, and we are sort of quite lucky to be sort of in some ways taken care of by the sort of bigger Cranbrook educational sort of community. Mm -hmm. um, but it also is a sort of counterpoint in that the academy is not necessarily sort of the favorite child in the bunch. The high school and I think some of the other schools have all of their path or sort of walkways are heated. And this, these are very so, exclusive schools, right? Yeah. Paying for $40,000 a year to attend. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so. But it, I think it's interesting that within your work you are not only forming a comment on the larger whole in which the students um, exist, but you also create some kind of irritant and disruption for not only student comprehension of that environment, but also, I guess, the foundations in which those environments are built, it seems. Yeah, and it may not be quite as clear in this piece, but in lots of my work, it's very clearly appropriated forms, sort of trying to think about 
the ideas of originality that have such a like sort of cult like status in a place like well most art schools, but especially Cranbrook, I think is really fascinated with making sort of new interesting objects um, mm -hmm. and really sort of convinced that sort of the things that are produced are in some ways unique and new mm -hmm. I think and most of my work is sort of in almost direct opposition to that. None of the forms are new. Most of the ideas are sort of also not my own. I'm not sort of in any way claiming to be an original thinker. And I think that that, but that for me is an important sort of feature of art history and that we are always sort of standing on others' shoulders. I think um, through conversations with current students here at the academy, there's a huge importance placed on physical objects yeah. being designed and built in any of the departments, even like the three-dimensional design, which in its title makes some kind of connection to object. And so then when you have students like ourselves who are working with more ideas and objects become secondary to the conversations, it's met with a lot of opposition and a lot of confusion. And sometimes um, it's not quite understood on the levels in which we would hope it is. but. Um, there's definitely, I think, a lot of interest from other students in trying to grasp what the fields in which we're working, but it's definitely not the priority of the academy. I, I live off campus, and I think that's where my research and my projects initially stem from here at Cranbrook, is that I live in this place called Pontiac, and it's located within Oakland County, the same county as Bloomfield Hills. However, there are Bl huge... Bloomfield Hills is where Cranbrook is situated, let's be clear about that. Correct. And Pontiac is what, five, ten miles away? Seven miles. Seven miles, okay. So, um, I think it creates a really interesting juxtaposition between the place I live and the place I work and go to school. Um, all within the same county, all within seven miles of each other, that in the 20 minutes it takes me to drive to school, those seven miles, the average income from Pontiac to Cranbrook increases by a hundred thousand dollars and the crime rate decreases by seven hundred percent so there's huge disparities between the two communities and um it it's kind of a shock every day driving to and from school to this campus that was designed by one of the most famous architects of the 20th century to this place that is falling apart and being deserted and neglected mm -hmm. by its residents and the overall county community i mean there's a place in the middle of downtown, maybe you could explain that, but this is sort of an emblem of that desertion. Right? Yeah, um, the city center, I guess at one point, was really thriving and full of department stores, and it was where you would go to shop in Oakland County, and now there's nothing down there. Most of the buildings are abandoned, and there's a couple bars, there's a few like liquor party stores um, where you can buy cigarettes, and there's one or two music venues, but there's no business center and there's no culture in this area anymore and it's all been destroyed and people have left the cities as the city has begun to crumble. Mm -hmm. And, and a, that's a sort of trend that's been going and recognized for decades and there was a few projects that were sort of quite maybe <laughs> too optimistic that believed if we sort of build some high-rise business complexes or build the Phoenix Center, which was this sort of supposed to be the emblem of like rising again, um, the the sort of downtown area of Pontiac would sort of reemerge as sort of a thriving community, and now most of those office sort of buildings are deserted or have you know very few tenants, and the Phoenix Center has been closed, and they don't have the money. So, and the copper from the building was stolen and they don't, it would cost more to replace it than essentially to tear the building down. And so it's... Just to be clear, this is a large, yeah. right in the city center of Pontiac, this is a large um, conference venue yeah. um, center and car park with a road running underneath it. Yeah. Correct. That is yeah. now completely deserted and the road yeah. is shut. Yeah, the road shut because they can't afford to light the, or they can't afford to replace the copper piping and wiring anyways, to sort of light the road underneath. And I think that's really where maybe uh, a lot of my 
inspiration that my projects come from is this connection between this economic and social downfall of this place and then how people of power have been have the understanding that essentially if you build it they will come that by building structures and by influencing things through the built environment and architecture you can affect social and economic change so then examining the ideas of why we build within our communities of structures and architecture and roads and urban planning for either to illustrate wealth or to gain wealth are essentially the two reasons in which you build um, to show power or to earn power and then how that affects cities in maybe unsuccessful so successful ways excuse me um, is really where a lot of my influences come from on, in my research project. And I think it might be important to sort of point out how I don't know opulent <laughs> Blue Hill Hills is um, this is one of the richest places in America, right? Yeah, it's definitely one of the richest towns or sort of townships in America. I think there's a vast majority of the houses, if not all the houses, are worth more than a million dollars and are sort of more estates than simply homes. They're, well, yeah. um, there's a, a student in architecture whose name is... Can somebody help me out? He just bought a strip of land in Pompeo. Oh, oh Dan. Dan. Dan, yeah. yeah. So he buys a strip of land, which is a, a couple of acres, I think, mm -hmm. for, for $250. You can yeah. buy a home in Pontiac mm -hmm. for less than 1000 Yeah. Um, they have a lot of auctions in which they just try to get rid of property because they can't afford to upkeep the, the land or the homes, mm -hmm. and so they yeah. end up knocking down a lot of abandoned homes every week. And I think one of the most surprising features is so... In contrast, so Pontiac has roads that have fallen into disrepair because the city's run out of money. And Bloomfield Hills has roads that are still dirt, but it's a very sort of specific difference. They're the most manicured dirt roads you'll ever find, and they are intentionally not paved so that outsiders won't want to travel down them, sort of to keep the riffraff out. Um, it becomes a very exclusive community. Right. And in Bloomfield Hills, um, which is very evident of the wealth. Um, they specifically try to keep people out. They prevent um, the county bus lines from creating bus stops within the city limits because they don't want the type of people who ride buses to stop in Bloomfield Hills. Um, and so there's a bus stop on either side of the, or I guess, of the township line saying, this is where our boundaries are, and you can't. And there's no sidewalks on most of the streets mm -hmm. here because they don't want people who walk places. I learned this from yeah. a bit of first hand experience. The first <laughs> time, yes. You can't walk anywhere. Um, <clears throat> Come up to Pontiac, you can walk everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe it's worth, without making it sort of too cute, but um, discussing the way in which the situation in Pontiac is also mirrored in a much larger scale in Detroit. Oh, absolutely. There's a lot of, I guess, connections between the two. And how far away is Detroit? Um, from Pontiac, it is about 27 miles. And you just, we just drive down Woodward Avenue, which is this long road, which would just connect one to the other. I think the most interesting part, um, in the 1700s, there was the Saginaw Trail, which connected Detroit to Pontiac, which at that point were both very large, bustling, industrial on like, I guess, whatever terms that means in the 1700s, mm -hmm. um, industrial areas. And they created the first wooden plank road that connected those two cities. And it cost you a penny a mile to move down the roads. And then um, it was the first paved road in America. And there's huge connections between Woodward Avenue connecting Pontiac and Detroit and definitely showing the relationship. And even currently... At either end of Woodward, it dead ends at the riverfront facing Canada and then dead ends in the city center of Pontiac. There's two loops so that you can essentially continue to drive without ever stopping or making a U-turn, mm -hmm. the 27-mile the loop. Mm -hmm. I've been doing it several times because I think that this is a, again, without making it too crude, it's a sort of a metaphor for the kind of condition of America right now when you'll yep. go through... Uh, the area of millionaires through past eight mile, which is a dividing line between 
downtown Detroit, basically, mm-hmm. or the city limits of Detroit, through areas that just after eight miles go past where the Model T was built, mm-hmm. Highland Absolutely. Park, which was an area of um, thriving sort of middle class mm-hmm. sort of living at a, yeah. a, 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 during the, the kind of the, the flourishing of the motor trade down through Midtown where you're going to get the university area and, and then into downtown Detroit which is also financial or business yeah. financial but, but you, could you maybe say a little bit more about how the, 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 you were talking about the, the kind of population migration downtown Detroit is also very sparsely populated compared to what it used to be right absolutely um, and I think Woodward Avenue is it is like the epitome of why these places exist and the idea of the car is very important to Pontiac and Detroit. Um, basically, most of the headquarters for American car manufacturers are located downtown Detroit at the at one end of Woodward, and then all the uh, the original factories and plants where these cars were manufactured and created is at the other end end of Woodward in Pontiac, and it essentially from the the loop in Pontiac, the mile drive to the GM plants that used to that were the first and largest in the country, employing more um, factory workers than anywhere else. Um, so there's this huge connection between the motor industry and these two cities and Woodward. And then as they started to move manufacturing and um, factory workers to foreign countries, these factories fell into disrepair and were abandoned leading to a loss of jobs and opportunities for the people in these cities, which led to the rise of Oakland County. Those who were wealthier or middle class were able to find a way out of Detroit or a way out of Pontiac and kind of settled in between the two places in Birmingham and Bloomfield Hills and near Cranbrook. This is all around Cranbrook. Yeah, Mm -hmm. and these opportunities really led to the downfall of both cities, not only because of the lack of jobs, but the lack of tax revenue from residents. So Oakland County has become sort of a parasitic form for just for Detroit, kind of sucking the life out of it. But it's really interesting that there's this heavy correlation that one can't exist without the other, though Oakland County always tries to separate itself and really form a gap between themselves in Detroit, but that there's some very strong ties that can never be destroyed between the two. One thing I wasn't quite prepared for, even though I'd, of course I'd heard about it, but just driving around Detroit, maybe you can kind of give a picture of this, is just how deserted it is. This is a city that at one point was the fastest growing city in America, and at one point was over 2 million people. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And is now, what, 700,000? Yeah. It was built in the 80s, or leading up to the 80s. They were anticipating a million person growth within 20 years. And so the city, as it stands today, was built for 3 million people. And you can tell that by the speed limits of the roads and the size of the roads. Um, and now holds 700,000 people. And that decline started in the 80s and really led to an almost like Wild West desolation kind of feel to this city where maybe on the bright side has created a wildlife haven almost for animals, coyotes (laughs) and wild quail and river otters are returning to the city. And as you mentioned yesterday when we were out looking at the water, it's some of the cleanest water we any of us have ever seen, almost comparable to the Caribbean, because <laughs> of the lack of manufacturing and pollution from what you expect in an urban center. I mean, there are some sort of parts of Detroit where you can drive for a few blocks and not seeing a single house. In areas that used to be very densely populated, have sort of 10 houses in a block, and all of them have sort of been leveled, and you'll be left with sort of overgrown fields surrounding very sort of regimented sort of like sort of a grid of roads that simply now exists for itself and not to sort of support housing or anything. Um, But it's the the way within a five minute walk of what I would consider a downtown and a a contemporary city, you don't even get spaces. You get blown out houses that have been burnt (laughs) and they're still standing there. They haven't been knocked down and 
factories and office blocks and hospitals. We drove past a hospital yesterday that was disused. And mm-hmm. Absolutely. You see that everywhere you go. Um, I mean, when you lose over half your population, you also lose half your infrastructure. And so it becomes a city that really struggles and it's, and is really kind of sad and unfortunate in the way that you might be the only person living within five blocks. Um, but then there are other areas that are very highly occupied where every house is full and that the, the values of homes is pretty comparable to other areas in, this, in the country um, who also have thriving centers of business and mm-hmm. commerce and actually have a lot of potential. And then there's some really desolate areas mm-hmm. as well. So it, there's kind of there's both, and it's it's not that the entire city is headed towards a downfall, but mm-hmm. it's hard to provide the infrastructure of protection and fire services and electricity and even basic garbage services mm-hmm. when you have a city the size of Detroit um, with the residents of much smaller areas, and which is being declared. Bankrupt at the mm-hmm. end of 2013, right? It's, yeah. it's in admer- emergency administration. Correct. Yeah. Much yeah. like Ireland was at one point. <laughs> and Pontiac as well. And Pontiac as well. Ireland also lost its sovereignty because it was bankrupt and this was also driven by a, kind of an economic kind of crisis, as it were. Right. And they talk mm-hmm. about that a lot in Pontiac. Um, and I feel what makes Pontiac's situation interesting is it's one of the poorest cities in the country in one of the richest counties in the country. So they are they are provided opportunities where, though they haven't lost their sovereignty, so to speak, um, they all their services, their fire and emergency services and police have been uh, have been taken over by the county. So well, I would I would argue that I think they have lost their sovereignty, considering their city council can't make any decisions that aren't then or like they, they can make a decision but it has to be approved by sort of an outsider um like the emergency city manager still even though he's sort of given back control of the city he still is has the sort of ultimate veto yeah i think they've definitely been stripped of their democratic process in the in the same way that detroit under city management will find itself very shortly that as a mayor of Pontiac or Detroit, it's just a title. There's no power that comes with it. And there have been severe pay cuts in city council members and mayors to the point where they're considered part-time employees and have to find alternative jobs as well. And that votes of city council members and the mayor mean nothing and hold no weight over the power of the city managers who become this I guess, um, how would you say it? Well, I mean, they, I don't know, might be too strong a word, but they're almost, not tyrants, but they are sort of appointed by an outside, sort of appointed by the governor to sort of be the overseer for the city. Um, it becomes almost and a dictatorship. Are, yeah, and they're unelected, so. Yeah, and they can reign, I guess if we're going to use these terms, for as long as they see fit until they decide that they're done. And then once they decide they're done, they can also decide the future processes for these cities for as long as they want. They could say for the next 50 years, no one has any power, and every decision have to go through my grandson if they really wanted to. Mm-hmm. Um, and so they, they essentially do become tyrants, and they, have all, they wield all the power and they only ever have to answer to the governor. Sure. I mean, there's, there's a serious debate, right, mm-hmm. about whether the DIA, which is the Detroit Institute of Art, right. international really kind of um, recognized art collection, yeah. but uh, including Rembrandt's and, of course, the Diego Rivera murals. But, and there's a serious discussion that should be solved. To right. To yeah. pay for fire services or <laughs> to fill the potholes or whatever it is. Right? Um, yeah, I mean, that was one of the lead or sort of major debates around the bankruptcy of Detroit was if the sort of DIA is considered an asset of the city or if the artwork in their collection is considered sort of commonly held or commonly owned by all the people of Detroit Mm -hmm. and not necessarily sort of controlled or held by the city as a 
sort of more corporate entity. Um, and th there has sort of been a glimmer of a solution. There have been a number of sort of large foundations and philanthropists around the country who've sort of said if we put up $300 million plus, instead of selling the artwork, essentially they give the DIA sort of its own authority and sort of cut the ties to the city for this pretty substantial price tag. Um, so that, yeah. that, that's a nice way of sort of moving on to that, maybe the final bit to talk about Detroit, the potential for um, cultural activities, let's call them, or, or kind of forms of artistic and, and so forth activities to play a role in this. Um, so we've got the DIA, which is this sort of particular kind of model of culture there. And, and one of the words that keeps getting mentioned a lot is potential. Mm -hmm. Another kind of reference point that's mentioned all the time, but maybe we can talk about whether it's a, an appropriate one, is sort of Berlin. Mm -hmm. We hear that a lot because things happen there at a certain point. People yeah. saw potential. So we've got potential, but then another word that's also been kind of mentioned is gentrification, and whether that's a positive or negative for us. Mm -hmm. What do you think about those? Um, I think there's absolutely tons of potential in either of these locations, Detroit and Pontiac, because of the cost of living. Uh, it's so incredibly cheap, and because they're industrial centers, there's a lot of the facilities in which you need to create your artwork from iron and steel workers to manufacturers and suppliers of wholesale goods. Um, which is what I mean. But, yeah, and I think the biggest element of that is these sort of old warehouses that you can sort of rent studio space in and have more space than I ever imagined. I mean, if I wanted to sort of, when I graduate, stay here, I could have a studio larger than I ever imagined for a fraction of the price I'd pay for sort of a bedroom back home. And it provides a lot of opportunities in that, that you can really get whatever you need for a pretty inexpensive cost. But then it definitely feeds into the conversation of what gentrification means to these cities and whether what we're doing is for the benefit of Detroit or for the benefit of culture or for the benefit of the residents and the people who live there, um, which I guess is pretty similar to the work that I do in Pontiac and the conversations that I kind of create, which I think become kind of a direct opposition of Dan and architecture who we also mentioned previously. I think that in my mind one thing that separates a little bit of the gentrification, gentrification talk in Pontiac versus Detroit is the amount of space in Detroit that is fallen into sort of complete disuse I think means that lots of the or when I sort of imagine lots of the negative effects of gentrification, it's essentially that people no longer have space to live. They're essentially left without a place in the city. Well, there, this is, um, there's a, an article in the recent Metro Times about, so you want to be a Detroiter, and what, as a newcomer, <laughs> should you be thinking about? And it tackles this issue of gentrification, mm -hmm. because there are, as it's called in the article, old Detroiters mm -hmm. who um, might be a little alienated by this form of gentrification. Right. It's a different kind of cultural form, let's say, mm -hmm. but also other people moving in, if it's going to raise property prices, will raise taxes mm -hmm. and might lead to a kind of an exclusion from people from places, right. for people from places where they've lived their entire life. Mm -hmm. So this is, there are negative signs to certain forms of gentrification. Right. Absolutely. I think with uh, my conversations, we have a, an artist in residence here in Cranbrook who is building a lawn tennis club. This is Bill Massey in architecture. Correct. Um, it's a lawn tennis club, which becomes a pretty exclusive set of tennis players alone. Um, this is the, this, let's be clear, this is going to be the first grass court in all America, right? Is I believe so. Yeah. I believe, yeah. And um, it's mainly being built to attract those of Bloomfield Hills and the Cranbrook type Mm -hmm. And it's located in the middle of one of the most desolate areas in Pontiac. Mm -hmm. um, and so through that, him and I have had lots of conversations about gentrification and the effects of this very wealthy, exclusive tennis club on the surrounding community. Um, and though 
it does provide a certain conversation style that happens between the members of Bloomfield Health having to go to a place like Pontiac to get the services of a very exclusive type of um, person. It benefits the community of Pontiac as well, and it doesn't, and because of how taxes are run, specifically in that city, and I'm not familiar with tax systems in Detroit, it will not raise property values of the, or taxes mm -hmm. of the existing own, owners of homes surrounding the club. Mm -hmm. It just gives them a higher potential for if they see a future to sell this property. But given the desolation of these areas, you'd need a pretty high rate of people moving in and gentrification as to mm -hmm. speak to yeah. affect any kind of permanent change. Uh, I mean, in in any sen sense, I guess, for Detroit to even get to the point where it would be unaffordable for anyone to live, they would need to get very close to the two million person <laughs> range. I, I think, well, yeah, I, in my mind, the bigger sort of cultural maybe problem isn't necessarily the direct monetary impact of gentrification like happens in you know areas of New York City or other large sort of cities with sort of more and more sort of cultural sort of capital being pushed in but in Detroit there's sort of a long history of artists coming and working and making a project, buying a house, making a project in it, and once they sort of get recognized for it or once the project's done, they just pull out. And so it's a very, I mean, maybe also parasitic sort of relationship where the artists are essentially using the city as merely a sort of means to an end mm -hmm. and don't have sort of a commitment to the sort of city. And I suppose it should be mentioned, and we have to be very careful about this. I do in particular because I'm quite ignorant of the situation, right? So I'll count, yeah. add a caveat there, but there are also race politics at play here as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Right. Oh, yeah. yeah. And I think that's a huge issue as well, that um, with gentrification and artists moving in, specifically, for the most part, them being white so artists. downtown Detroit is 80% black. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Oakland is what, 90% white? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then Pontiac is also predominantly a black neighborhood, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that is cashed out in class terms. Oh, yeah. Not mm -hmm. just race terms. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then when you have a huge amount of white artists, primarily from middle class backgrounds, moving into these areas, you get not only economic and class differences, but cultural and race differences, which mm -hmm through the acts of gentrification, they become erased. And um, we lose a lot of the important history of either of those cities through these actions. Um, and it definitely plays a huge role in how you can talk about the management of these cities, the economic standpoints, and then the attitude of the residents of Bloomfield Hills and Oakland County to these communities. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. and I, I don't think it can be stated in strong enough terms that the overlying importance of racial politics in the last 30 to 60 years in Detroit, Oakland County, and Pontiac. It is a very charged environment. From the race riots of 45 and 1960 through the civil rights act, um, movement in the late 60s, and then you see a lot of that today even playing part in yeah. that I mean, Pontiac. Detroit's mayor is the first white mayor in, I think, 30 years. Um, and that was sort of a very huge, contentious issue. Even though he has basically zero power, it's still a sort of, what does that mean symbolically? Um, the sort of, kind of atrocious comments of the sort of executive manager of Oakland County, who is conservative, white, and rich, and very sort of... Uh, class insensitive, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I think along with all these issues and concerns, there's definitely a huge um, pride of place for those who live in Detroit from, I guess you yeah. see these all over the place, the Detroit Hustles Harder shirts. And um, I mean, there's a huge localized movement of local artists and local 
meats and cheeses and pickles and local businesses owned by people who live right around the block. Um, and then you even see a lot of current businesses helping future businesses to open, to open, excuse me, um, with a huge, like, they want there to be people there and they want people to have pride in the fact that they're from Detroit yeah. and that they work here. And I guess some of the more famous superstars from Detroit have also made a huge effort to pull revenue into the city from Kid Rock and his museum and restaurant to Eminem um, trying to convince movie filmers to shoot their movies in Detroit mm -hmm. because it's a huge source of revenue for the city. Yeah. So there's there's a lot of pride in being from Detroit and a lot of people who are hard set on staying here and making this place a functioning city on whatever level it finds itself. And Jack White paying to kind of save the, the Masonic Temple, which is an astonishing building, mm -hmm. with a large auditorium in it, the largest Masonic Temple in the world. Mm -hmm. Really kind of astonishingly, uh, astonishing building. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. you.